Okay, it is my, my honor to uh, chair this last session of the, of the conference. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Ariella Azulai, who is Professor of Modern Culture and Media and Comparative Literature at Brown. Uh, she is the author of numerous books, including uh, in recent years, um, I'm Dewole Luski and Horizontal Photography, published in 2013 by Cornell University Press and Leuven University Press. Uh, Civil Imagination, the Political Ontology of Photography, published by Verso in 2012, and with Adi Ophir, The One State Condition, Occupation and Democracy Between the Sea and the River, uh, published by Stanford in 2012. She's also a curator of several photography exhibits and a director of documentary films, most recently Civil Alliances, Palestine 47-48. Uh, in 2012, and her paper will be on uh, sovereignty today. I will also, following the custom, um, introduce our second speaker, James Kusner, who is assistant professor of English, also at Brown. He is the author of Open Subjects, English Renaissance, Republicans, Modern Selfhoods, and the Virtue of uh, Vulnerability, published in 2011 by Edinburgh University Press, and a second book titled Shakespeare as a Way of Life, Skeptical Practice and the Politics of Weakness, published by Fordham, forthcoming next year, and his current project is a study of John Donne, the metaphysical imagination, and the experience of counterintuitive liberties. His paper today is titled Bondage. Thank you, Angam, and I would like to thank uh, uh, Tim, Bonnie, who is not here, Adi, Amanda, uh, and all the participants for making these two days so wonderful, and I'm grateful that you stayed here. I mean, <laughs> um, okay. So um, I would like to start directly. It's late. In the human condition, Hannah Arendt refers to theater as the political art par excellence. A delineated place, a theater, is necessary, she implies, for actions to be repeated, imitated, and played out. However, the enclosed space she associates with theater is not what makes theater the political art par excellence. It is rather the fact that it is, and I'm quoting, the only uh, art whose sole object is man in his relationship to others. Uh, Arendt's assumption about a delineated space seems like a received idea or cliché about art, reiterated without paying attention to how it contradicts her own argument that an action is never carried to completion by the one who starts it, or in, or in other words, that, action, that actions are always continued unexpectedly by others, who may arrive any time from anywhere. Rather than engaging farther with this mismatch in the context of Arendt's writings, I propose in my reflection on sovereignty to bracket Arendt's spatial understanding of theater and deploy her statement in reverse. Politics is the theatrical art par excellence. This reversal enables the study of a field of interactions where actions always compete with other actions on and off stage and accounts for the fabrication of a demarcated theatrical space, what is called the stage of history, defined mainly by the sovereign's actions and decisions, as if these sovereign's actions could be self-contained, and as if they did not struggle against or respond to the actions and decisions of others. Modern sovereignty, occasionally called popular sovereignty since the 18th century, but more often described in an unqualified way as simply sovereignty, has never been about the demos as the source of its authority, but about manipulating the body politic and rendering competition with other political actors, actions, and formations inexistent, or at least unrecognizable, or what John Cox uh, described yesterday with the term, with the concept, disappearance. This elimination of competition is not achieved through the sovereign's acts on an already existing and well demarcated stage. Uh, this sovereignty is formed through violent processes of destroying existing political formations, differentiating between people, and imposing strict divisions and roles on people. I propose to identify this type of sovereignty by the structure of its body politic, 
and call it differential sovereignty. By dividing the body politic and creating distinct political, distinct, distinct, I don't know, distinct, distinct, distinct political classes, sovereign power also assigns individuals with roles that fit their opposition in the political space, that is, citizens, non-citizens, immigrants, refugees, etc. Performing these roles, individuals partake in the reproduction of the differential rule, often regardless of their concrete gestures, thoughts, actions, etc. By the body politic, I refer, though, to all the people who are assigned political roles that include them, often through violent means, in the theater of sovereignty, which labels them citizens, transported, évolués, deported, relegated, émigrés, infiltrators, slaves, servants, free blacks, Indian, women, vagrant, paupers, redskins, indentured servants, present absentees, which is the Israeli invention, refugees, resident alliance, illegal immigrants, and the like. These roles, enforced through violence and maintained through law enforcement, determine the scope of their actions. It is all but impossible for members of the body politic to deviate from them without being punished by a sovereign power, including those who are often not recognized as political actors by sovereign power in the, in the study and conceptualization of the body politic and relating to the body politic as consisting of the entire uh, body of the governed, this is a first step in my attempt to study sovereignty independently of its own terms. This cannot be done without questioning also the way time and space are manufactured, such that only citizens are associated with so sovereign territories and histories. The temporal, spatial, and body political are the three principles through which I propose to study modern sovereignty. Rather than focusing on sovereign power that acts unilaterally from the stage upon members of the body politic and subjugates them, I propose to study sovereignty as it is reproduced through the bodies and roles that comprise the body politic. My assumption is that this triple, this triple principle, enforced violently through imperialism, has conditioned the way sovereignty is experienced and discussed as a discrete state formation bounded by local circumstances and studied along the temporal, spatial, and political parameter that it imposes. In other words, modern sovereignty creates its own phenomenal field and epistemic apparatus and interpolates us to relate to, the field, to, uh, to this field as the stage of history. Studying sovereignty from outside of its own temporal, spatial, and political principles requires one to study the way time is sliced through new beginnings, revolutions, for example. Our territories are cut, and our people are violently differentiated to embody those different political roles that I just uh, cited. In this sense, I argue, the constitution of differential sovereignty in each and every modern sovereignty should be studied in continuity with the imperial violence that preceded it and prepared the terrain for it. Differential sovereignty is the ultimate instrument for the consolidation of imperialist gains and their institutionalization as the transcendental condition of politics. Only against this background can one understand how and why sovereignty is imposed, studied, and referred to in an unqualified form, sovereignty or called popular, even though its early manifestations in the French and American revolutions were differential par excellence. All too often, the use of the term sovereignty, especially when it refers to its moment of self-constitution, is already a manifestation of the logic of unqualified sovereignty. The reference to a moment of constitution that disrupts time as the effect of relegating to a begone past a precedent phase of violence against competing forms of rule and being together, which now appear obsolete and irrelevant to the group who seized power and engineered the ethnic and racial composition of the body politic. 
Similarly, when sovereignty is studied within the territory which sovereign power declares as its own and under its rule, the power it exercises is it, uh, in its offshore territories or in refugee camps uh, 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 along its border, sorry, in refugee camps uh, 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 that this state borders consolidate is conceived as incidental to it. When sovereignty's source of authority is associated only with the body of those who were made citizens, all those who were made non-citizens are conceived as superfluous in Arendtian language, foreigners, intruders, infiltrators, or refugees, altogether irrelevant to the study of sovereignty, even though uh, they were made the embodiments of these categories at the same time that others were made citizens. Sovereignty belongs to a particular family of political concepts that were shaped under imperialism and which I propose to call unqualified concepts. Their unqualified nature is not a mark of, be, of uh, their being open or their polysemous nature, as many historians and uh, political uh, theorists have argued, but rather the imperial world uh, out of which they emerged and the violence that was required for imperialist powers to suppress rival formations and institute an unqualified sovereignty as uh, hegemonic or as the standard. Alternative comp competing formations of key concepts such as sovereignty or citizen had to be repressed and outlawed in order to maintain a space that made their qualification unnecessary and to construe them as transcendental conditions of politics. When a particular type of sovereignty, monarchical sovereignty, was questioned, there was, mo there was more than one answer to the question, what is sovereignty and how it can be imagined and shaped? These answers were not given solely by those thinkers known as philosophers, and they should not be sought only among this small tribe. In what follows, I will try to answer the question, what is sovereignty from the perspective of non-citizens and their experience as non-citizen subjects who are governed alongside and interact with other subjects to whom the same ruling power granted or wielded citizenship. Sovereignty did not become the transcendental condition of uh, politics at one stroke. Rather than studying it from the perspective of its constitutive moment and its discrete manifestations in what have come to be different nation states, I start my study of modern sovereignty by focusing on what I argue is inseparable, in, inseparable from it, its two inaugural acts. The first act consists in the destruction of political, social, and cultural structures, mainly in the New World or in, or in other offshore territories. When the formation of popular sovereignty in the 18th century is studied in opposition to monarchical sovereignty in France or in the pre-revolutionary U.S. colonies, this destruction is all too often occluded and kept irrelevant to the study of sovereignty. The second inaugural act of violence consists in the differentiation of the governed popula population into distinct groups, each with its own rights, or lack thereof, and mode of governance. Studying enslavement, cultural destruction, ethnic cleansing, and transfer of population uh, performed again and again since the 15th century as the first phase of the constitution of any popular sovereignty uh, provides us with a different phenomenal field out of which we can start to account for the transformation of this imperial violence into the terrain from which discrete sovereignties could emerge as rule of law. I will draw an example from the era known as the French Revolution and dwell on the trope of the stage and the notion of political actors. In his book, Political Actors, the historian Paul Friedland uh, anchors the radical transformation in the relationship between politics and theater in the change uh, in the character of the stages on which they, uh, they were performed. Prior to the mid-18th century, 
politics was performed on a sacred stage where the intangible body was made present, was represented, while theater was performed on a profane stage, the intangible body, of course, body of the king. These two stages were kept separate and parallel. In the course of a few decades, with the advent of public opinion, the differentiation between the two stages was weakened and, and I'm quoting again from his book, an underlying revolution in the conception of representation itself manifested itself in both realms. Um, in, po unquote. in politics, it was articulated through the representative democracy, and in theater, through the ways actors started to, and I'm quoting from Friedland again, started to represent their characters abstractly in a manner that seemed realistic to the audience rather than a, man a manner that the actors experienced as real, as unquote. Barriers that kept theatrical and political actors apart collapsed in the late 18th century France. Actors became politicians while politicians took acting classes. And people could, for a fee, perform in a mock national assembly while deputies could put on shows uh, in the real, uh, could uh, put, on, put on shows in the real assembly. Friedland associates this merging with a modern regime of representation in which intangible body, and I'm quoting again, intangible body is abstractly represented in spirit rather than in substance, unquote, and wherein the legitimacy of the representation no longer depended, and I'm quoting him again, no longer depended upon the physical identity between the actor and the object of representation, but upon the political audience's uh, willingness to accept the representative body as uh, vraisemblable. I don't know how you say it in English, vraisemblable, um, whatever. <laughs> okay, vraisemblable, unquote. Uh, this modern regime of representation is emblematized by the persona of the citizen, abstracted from his particular traits in order to be equal to others. But this does not mean equal to any other, but solely to those who, after violent processes of sovereignty have taken root, are allowed to become citizens. Embodying their roles uh, as citizens in the, the theater of differential sovereignty through their actions and speech, they demarcate these actors, these citizen actors, the uh, hypothetical stage of sovereignty while endowing uh, each other with the power to relate to all others, non-citizens, as if they were off stage, regardless of the special organization. The known fact that the French Revolution only granted citizenship to a minority among the governed, white males, and that political actors under democratic regimes have been identified as a matter of course with this, this persona of citizen only, thus bracketing all the groups of non-citizens who have been excluded from, or more accurately, included differentially in this kind of narrative, do not prevent the reiteration of the same structure for narrating the unknown French Revolution once and again. This structure consists of two assumptions about opposition and progress with respect to monarchy. The transition from the ancien regime to the nouveau regime, from monarchy to democracy, from one type of sovereignty to a new one, is assumed as a factual matter that need not be questioned. The fact that this emancipatory narrative of a small elite of white males vis-a-vis -vis the monarchy is blatantly at odds with the massive imperial violence exercised against large groups of people who were made, made into governed populations has not prevented the reiteration of this narrative in numerous historical and philosophical accounts of sovereignty. This gap between the concept of sovereignty and accounts of, accounts of imperial violence that makes the two separate objects of study is not incidental, but constitutive for the fields of political theory and history. Through the two inaugural acts that I discussed earlier, imperialism shaped the world by which political discourse is bound, as it conceived imperial violence as a given condition, dissociated from the constitution and reproduction of sovereignty. In 1782, seven years prior to what is known 
Sorry to repeat what is known, but I cannot call it the French Revolution. What is known as the outbreak of the French Revolution, Olympe de Gouges, then a, then a young, rather unknown writer, wrote her first play, Black Slavery, or I'm grateful to Rida if she's here for her suggestion to call it Blake Enslavement. Its plot is deliberately located in a French colony, a territory that was considered external to French monarchical sovereignty, and the political rule of its subjects remains foreign and irrelevant to the discursive uh, political and philosophical scope of the concept of sovereignty. The play narrates the story of two black slaves, Zamor, who killed his master's white guard after the latter demanded that he attack his beloved partner, a slave like himself, for having refused the guard's overtures, and Mirza, his female partner. The play starts after the murder, as the two slaves are running away. On their way, uh, they rescue a French couple whose boat has sunk. The grateful white French couple proposes to be their allies and help them uh, to find shelter from their persecutors. For the most part, the play deals with the question of whether the runaways will be executed or spared. Numerous characters, including uh, the French woman rescued by Zamor, the wife of the governor of the colony, other slaves, servants and apprentices, and even a military officer, all gradually come together to save Zamor and Mirza from a band of armed men who, led by a judge, hunt them down to execute them for murder. Joining Zamor and Mirza is, an act of, is not an act of compassion exercised by a benevolent white protagonist uh, in front of an appreciative uh, audience, but rather a revolutionary moment of grace when varied members of the body politic, one after the other, realize the structural complicity implied in the differentiated role uh, they inhabit in enslaving others and exposing them to death. They now start to act and interact with each other without adhering to the roles assigned to them in the differential body politic. I propose to read this play located in a colony as an essay on sovereignty, signaling from where sovereignty should have been reimagined. De Gouge was not a prophet who anticipated the white male revolution known as the French Revolution, as her text is often read by others, nor did she inhabit uh, the position of the philosopher who writes a template for a new ideal society. The revolution was dynamic, she writes in this play, and falls within the body politic without assuming the convergence of sovereignty in a monolithic power that acts from on high. In writing this play, she responded to a reality of imperial and racial violence where people were enslaved due to their skin color, but also because of their daily revolutionary actions and gestures against the violence that forced them to inhabit the roles of slaves and disposable people in a differential body politic. Moreover, the Gouge uh, play is not simply an essay on a discreet and accomplished sovereignty, but an essay on the competition between one type of sovereignty based on the principle of differentiality and another possible formation of sovereignty that would uh, take uh, co-citizenship as its organizing principle. At the center of the Gouge's play, you do not find the violence exercised in the process of enslaving people and maintaining them as slaves. This is not a pedagogic tale about unilateral actions seeking to convince its audience that this type of violence is outrageous. That slavery is outrageous is beyond doubt in the play. One needs, not to spend, uh, one needs uh, to spend no more words on it. At stake is rather the division of roles among all members of the governed population of which the body politic is composed. This division uh, is what, define, what defines the type of sovereignty and shapes the sovereign's action, priorities, and distribution of resources and bodies. It is the constitutive violence through which members of the body politic are differentiated and compelled to act according to their assigned roles that is contested in this play. 
The good challenges the way differential sovereignty is reaffirmed with each reiterated performance of each role and caters to the urgent need to imagine another type of body politic through which a different sovereignty would be performed. Saying it differently is the division of roles that, uh, through the division of roles that we can identify the type of sovereignty. In our play, the monarch is not conceived as omnipotent and he is not considered the ultimate origin of his acts, as these are always shaped and limited by his subjects, uh, by his subjects' actions and interaction. When the Gouge wrote her play, the differential body politic was already there, but the polarizing or progressive narrative and the concept of sovereignty uh, as the transcendental uh, conditions of politics had not yet become a principle of faith, of faith sorry, or a metaphysical axiom. In the Goose play, the transition from monarchy to democracy is not associated with progress. Sovereignty is not reduced to the pole of sovereign power. And the transition from one type of sovereignty to another is not anchored in an external source of authority, but rather in an inclusive principle according to which the body politic is structured. Similarly, massive abduction, genocide, and enslavement are not positioned outside of the field of sovereignty, but rather seen as its most mundane expressions. <coughs> In the theater of differential sovereignty, political actors, through their assigned roles, are structurally pushed, lured, uh, and incited to act against each other. The division of roles is not flexible. And roles are almost always prescribed for life with very limited choice. Even though participation in this theater is mandatory for all governed subjects, not only citizens, but also second class citizens and non citizens who inevitably share the same stage, which is unbounded, as I said, only citizens and the sovereign are counted as political actors. Denied citizenship and deprived of the status of an actor in the new political formation and historical stage, Olympe de Gouges sought ways to challenge the demarcation lines that kept her and members of other groups off stage. She questioned the legitimacy of a popular sovereignty that related to the body politic uh, as if women, people of color, and members of the lower class were not part of it. Horrified by the inclination of the Assembly, of the National Assembly, to base its authority on the execution of the king, she argued for including the king as a citizen who takes part, like any other, in the formation of a new body politic. For her, the reign of terror started at the moment when the decision to take the life of the king was taken, and not when Robespierre rose to power. In the text that led to her own execution, the three ballots, the Gouge questioned the new political regime, its mechanism of self-reproduction, and its tyrannical actions. Many of her texts, including this one, begin by directly addressing the members of the body politic who happen to be in power. In the three ballots, she addresses uh, the sovereign, blaming him for being just one in a long, continuous lineage of th tyrants. As long as a, as, a lar as a large group of people are excluded from the body politic, she implies, there can be no significant difference between a republican, a federalist, a monarchic, and a democratic regime. And I'm quoting from the Gouge, the constitution is null and void if the majority of individuals composing the nation has not cooperated in its drafting. She wrote when she archived the Declaration of the Rights of Men and Citizens uh, by creating her own version, the Declara Declaration of the Rights of Women and Female Citizens. And I won't have time to dwell on it, but her declaration for me is another form of an archive because she archived the Declaration of uh, White Male in her own uh, uh, declaration. Uh, what is striking in black slavery or black enslavement and the Gouge's uh, later writings in which he addresses the question of sovereignty is that the presence of the sovereign is relegated to the background. He is not abolished, but rather substituted or multiplied by proxies or rendered specially distant. His proxy in Blake's enslave enslavement, the governor, is absent through most of the play. 
This remoteness enables one, of, uh, what enables one to see the performance of sovereignty as a performance of the division of roles and to follow the way sovereignty is reshaped when those excluded from the stage of differential sovereignty cease to be transparent. While awaiting for the governor, the governed cross, blur, and redraw the confines of their roles and the lines that separate types of subjects, men from women, slaves from free black, black from white, laymen from functionaries, soldiers from civilians, governed from governors, victims from perpetrators, citizens and ref from refugees. Together, the governed undo the separation lines and transform them into the malleable substance of sovereignty. The body politic is transformed so much that upon his return, the sovereign's proxy finds, finds out that his power to take life has become inoperative, even without his right to do so being formally annulled. Empowered by the new formation of the body politic, the new formation that came out in his absence, the governor, the sovereign's uh, pro proxy, realizes that he is able to reject the law of the colony that the judge seeks to enforce and to free the two slaves, Zamora and Mirza, without punishment. In doing so, he acknowledges their right to resist enslavement and the right of other members of the community to refuse the role assigned to them in the division of roles that enables and perpetuates slavery, or what I would say in another context, that they exercise their right not to be perpetrators. Unable to ignore the transformation of the body politic, the governor realizes he can no longer enforce the law whose aim is to keep the members of the body politic differentiated. However, our of his subjection to the king and the limits of his power to sanction the new formation of the body politic as law, that is, to free all slaves, the governor states his wish. Um, would I might uh, also give liberty to all your fellow men, or at least temper their fate, unquote, from the play. When the mainland and the colonies are conceived as parts of one continuous temporal and spatial unit, it becomes clear that the principle of differential ruling had been uh, thought, practiced, and institutionalized long before the advent of what is called modern, uh, modern what is called popular sovereignty. Its alleged newness was not due to its being unprecedented, but rather to a wrong impression derived from the destruction of everything that preceded it, political formations first and foremost. From the very beginning of what is known as popular sovereignty, the sovereignty these white male elites strive to constitute was exclusive and differential. Differential types of political formations that existed prior to the 18th century, those known and researched as possibly competing formations, such as, for example, the Hansa City League and the City State, and those who were not considered as alternative sovereignties, like maroon societies in faraway lands, or the many political formations in what was made the New World, whose existence evaporated together with the people who were massacred, as well as resistance to differential sovereignty by slaves, people of color, and women, who have been continuously repressed and suppressed. Neither an unqualified uh, concept of sovereignty nor the concept of popular sovereignty can account for these competing political formations of sovereignty, both existing and potential, which have not been compromised by a differential body politic. When sovereignty is qualified for what it is, that is, when one grasps its underlying differential principle, one is capable of taking the first and necessary step towards reconstructing other competing formations from outside of the imperial modern imaginary. And this outside is not in the future, it's in the past, but I won't have time to dwell on it. Imagining other political formations is not about progressing toward a different future, as if the outcome of a continuous past uh, uh, could be left as uh, as if the outcome of a continuous past could be left unreversed or generating more fantasies of miraculous new beginnings or democracies to come. It is rather 
uh, about potentializing and reactivating options that were made obsolete by uh, actively, concretely disengaging from and undoing the categories through which the long-lasting violence of differential sovereignty could remain unacknowledged, as citizens were trained to recognize other people according to the roles they were forced to embody, property, refugees, or infiltrators. These embodied categories were always experienced and conceived as detached from the political regimes that produced them over 500 years of imperial history, during which the imperial apparatus yielded ostensibly neutral categories that became key political concepts, that is, citizens or refugees. For example, Palestinian, uh, uh, those who are called Palestinian refugees are not associated to the sovereign regime that expelled them. And those who are called uh, Palestinian refugees because I think that they should be called the expellee of the uh, Jewish regime. But this is in parentheses. I tried not to speak about Palestine in my paper today. <laughs> this is why there is recurrence to my second beloved topic, which is the 18th century. These embodied categories were always experienced and conceived as detached from the political regimes. That, uh, sorry, I read this. Unlearning sovereignty is a way to question the very position of the actor we inhabit and the temporality of progress, progress implied in it. When political actors unlearn differential sovereignty together with others who are forced or interpolated to embody other roles in this theater, the historical narrative of progress that presents, for example, women or people of color as living proof that political progress has been made come under question. Indeed, black people and women have been granted citizenship, but the differential structure of sovereignty has not been dismantled. Citizens Citizenship is still a form of recruitment of some of the governed into a mechanism of differential ruling in which other others are placed in the position of non or second class citizens. In order to rewind differential sovereignty and imagine alternative types of sovereignty, it is necessary to give up the temporality of progress according to which citizenship is extended from the center toward the periphery, from the white Christian Western male to his others. It is no less necessary to abandon the role borders play in protecting those who are placed inside at the core of citizenship as if differentiation between inside and outside reflected anything other than what has been achieved through imperial violence and to resist the division of citizens and refugees into different political uh, planets. The people who today make up the refugee crisis, again, what is known as the refugee crisis, are not merely uh, uprooted by an actual crisis in this or that region. They, like all millions of expellees, or dozens of millions of expellees, or maybe thousands of millions of expellees, structurally produced by imperialism over the last 500 years, keep fleeing their fate as descendants of people who, through processes of imperialist dispossession, transfer, partition, and enslavement, were deprived of different positions and statuses of co-citizenship in the societies where they lived prior to imperialism and where they enjoyed certain, even though often insufficient, com communal ties and rights. When they were forced to embody a variety of roles in the standardized theater of modern imperial sovereignty, others were provided with modern citizenship and made part of the light and were made part of the light weaponry of differential sovereignty that was shaped and institutionalized as the only possible political formation. If I add more time, my companion, uh, sorry, if I add more, more time, I, uh, would present, uh, I would have present to you my regular companion who was forced to become not only a non-citizen, but a non-governed subject. And since he resisted to inhabit his role in the theater of differential sovereignty, he was forced to become an infiltrator. And since he survived the fate of infiltrators being executed at the border, uh, 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 
sorry, and since, uh, uh, and he survived the fate of infiltrators being executed in the border to inhabit the role of a refugee, was forced to inhabit the role of refugee. I would have shared with you, uh, if I had more time, I would have shared with you uh, what uh, I would have shared with you one particular civil formation in Palestine in the late 40s that I learned together with this guy who is an infiltrator. Thank you. Uh, would you mind just, yes. just passing? Uh, hello. Uh, uh, no, no, I don't actually. Uh, I'll thank you, everyone, uh, for organizing this and uh, and for being here at this time. And I'll just I, I'll go fast. Um, but before I start, I did just want to note um, the irony on a Saturday when we all held ourselves captive in this room, in some cases for nine hours, that. This talk on bondage is, is the last one. Um, <laughs> I, I really appreciate that. Um, okay, so uh, the concept that I'm, I'm discussing today is bondage, and I really just want to ask one question about it, and that question is this. Is bondage the opposite of or antithetical to freedom? Not constraint, but, but bondage. The answer is, is a resounding yes, according to at least two schools of thinking about freedom. One that emphasizes negative freedoms or freedoms from, and another that emphasizes positive liberties or freedoms to. I say that the answer here is, is a yes because both schools metaphorize freedom as unobstructed movement, opposed to some constraint and to all bondage. So for both of these schools, free movement is the conceptual frame by which liberty is, is understood. Okay, so first let's think about negative freedoms or freedoms from. Uh, say, the seizure of property, arbitrary violence, and so on. Here, freedom takes the form of legal protections that surround and safeguard individuals who, within certain parameters, are then at liberty to operate. Those who emphasize negative freedom often, often focus on what Quentin Skinner calls the neo-Roman theory of liberty as non-domination. To enjoy this robust Republican liberty, Skinner argues, people must be not only free from actual unjust or unnecessary interference in the pursuit of their chosen goals, but must also be free from the very threat of such arbitrary interference. Skinner shows how from Cicero and Sallust in this English Civil War, I'm sorry, from Cicero and Sallust into the English Civil War and beyond, Republicans display how simply being subject to another's arbitrary will means being in a state of subjection. For Skinner, the stakes here are high. He writes that, quote, servitude breeds servility for, quote, if you live at the mercy of someone else, you will always have the strongest motives for playing safe. There will be many choices and other words that you will be disposed to avoid and many others that you will be disposed to make. And the cumulative effect will be to place extensive restraints on your freedom of action. According to Skinner and more contemporary political theorists who follow him, and here I have in mind people like Philip Pettit and John Maynard, freedom is first and foremost negative freedom, and Republicans conceive of it best, more than, say, someone like Isaiah Berlin, who, from this perspective, focuses too narrowly on actual unjust interference rather than the threat of it as well. Um, to be sure, many Republicans in the 17th century and beyond think of freedom in these terms, and I just want to look at a pair of quotes from a 17th century royalist turn Republican, March Montnetum, which show how freedom so conceived really does lend itself to metaphors of free movement. So shortly after the execution of Charles I, Nedham argues against the return of monarchy with reference to images of intense, excruciating physical constraint. If now we have burdens, Nedham writes, we must then look to have furrows made upon our backs. If now we are through necessity put to endure a few whips, we shall then of set purpose be chastised with scorpions. Nedham then explains the psychological damage done by monarchy through an invocation of Livy, who, quote, compares such as have been educated under a monarchy or tyranny to those beasts which have been caged or cooped up all their lives in a den, which, quote, if they be let loose, will return in again because they, do, they know not how to value or use their liberty. 
Nedim imagines oppressed subjects who cannot even appreciate being set free. Since servitude breeds servility from Nedim's perspective, burdens and restraints curb a freedom which he cannot help but frame his free movement. Of course, not everyone assumes that freedom from the threat of arbitrary interference is freedom's preeminent form. And that brings me to a second school of thinking about freedom, one that also identifies with republicanism uh, and that opposes freedom and bondage. From this perspective, the preeminent freedom is not freedom from the threat of arbitrary interference, the freedom which Mill would later call, quote, pursuing our own good in our own way and the only freedom deserving of the name. Rather, the preeminent freedom is the freedom to participate in government, to exercise positive political liberty. This freedom might, in fact, curb negative freedom and leave individuals open to interference. As Charles Taylor puts it, such freedom merely yields the, quote, sense of having a say in decisions in the political domain which would shape everyone's lives. Finding as much more value in what is public and shared as in what is private and individual, and freedom to rather than freedom from, these historians share with political philosophers who adopt and, and adapt Republican theory and are linked to communitarianism, a strand of thinking about the Republican legacy that's been developed by people like uh, Charles Taylor, who I mentioned, Michael Sandel, Michael Walzer, and Alastair McIntyre. Now, there are differences here, but despite these differences uh, from neo-Roman theorists like Skinner, thinkers of this sort also frame freedom primarily in terms of unimpeded movement. Uh, generally, they do so with reference to accessibility of public and political uh, spheres. John Milton's Areopagitica here, I think, serves as an emblematic 17th century example. Milton argues for a relatively open public sphere on several grounds. Uh, two grounds are, one, that an open public sphere would create a textual field that might permit the individual to become a, quote, scout into the regions of sin and falsity, and two, that reason was given to men so that we might, quote, discover onward things more remote from our knowledge, might move from regions that are known to those that are not. A relatively free, open public sphere helps individuals develop civic virtue that Milton imagines with metaphors of adept movement. So both those who privilege negative freedom and those who privilege positive liberty think of freedom primarily, certainly not solely, but primarily in terms of self-government and oftentimes sovereignty. For communitarians, self-government is most crucial at the level of the state, whereas for neo-Romans like Skinner, states should grant the protections that make individuals themselves uh, sovereign and able to, to govern themselves. So since freedom is thought in this way in terms of self-government, the predominant image is that of free movement and the predominant image for freedom's opposite is bondage. It just, it just makes sense. Some thinkers would take this tendency to metaphorize freedom as free movement much further and declare that it's actually an inevitable association within human experience. So cognitive scientists like George Lakoff and Mark Johnson, for instance, go so far as to say that all of our concepts of freedom, from the most conservative to the most radical, share a non-metaphorical core that consists in the ability to move freely. So according to Lakoff and Johnson, our earliest childhood experiences, when we react negatively, more or less immediately, to being unduly restrained and bound, render inevitable the opposition between freedom and bondage. The idea of freedom, Lakoff writes, is felt viscerally in our bodies and means, quote, being able to achieve purposes either because nothing is stopping you or because you have the requisite capacities or both. When we imagine the opposite of freedom, we naturally think of the following. In chains, imprisoned, enslaved, trapped, oppressed, held down, held back, threatened, fearful, powerless. So according to Lakoff and Johnson, not only do we think of freedom and bondage as antithetical, but it's actually impossible to think of freedom and bondage as other than antithetical. Obviously, that's, that's not, not true. Um, free movement itself is hardly the only image by which liberty is framed, particularly when freedom is not conceived primarily in terms of freedoms, that is, in terms of legal protections and entitlements, and instead conceived in terms of free experience, um, when people turn to thinking about what is free experience like. So for the second part of this talk, I want to just look at two examples. Those are the ones on the, on the handout in which freedom and bondage, or at least fetters and captivity, are not antithetical, but actually enter into indistinction. And in both examples, I want to claim that the indistinction uh, between freedom and bondage or captivity need not be dismissed as you know, merely ideological mystification. 
Uh, the first example is one of John Donne's divine poems, Better My Heart, Three-Person God. Um, so for a few minutes, I'll leave an explicitly uh, political register, and then I'll, I'll come back to it. Better my heart, three-person God, for you as yet but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend, that I may rise and stand, or throw me, and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. I, like a usurped town, to another do, labor to admit you, but oh, to no end, reason your viceroy in me, me should defend, but as captive, and proves weak or untrue. Yet dearly I love you, and would be loved fain, but am betrothed unto your enemy. Divorce me, untie, or break that knot again. Take me to you, imprison me, for I, except you enthrall me, never shall be free, nor ever chaste, except you ravish me. In the sense that Dunn's speaker pleads to be divorced and untied from Satan, which in another context would conjure the image of being freed of physical impediment. Yet Dunn also makes clear that the choice, not his to make, is the one set out by Martin Luther between two forms of bondage, to Satan or to God. Luther draws on two verses in Paul's epistle to the Romans, in which Paul writes not only that, quote, when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness, but also that when his addressees were, quote, made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. For Paul, freedom in one sphere is always accompanied by servitude in another. Explicating these verses, Luther writes that, quote, the human will is, as it were, a beast between the two, God and Satan. If God sit thereon, it wills and goes where God will. If Satan sits thereon, it wills and goes as Satan will. Nor is it in the power of its own will to choose to which rider it will run, nor which it will seek. Dunn's speaker, likewise, has as alternatives two forms of bondage over which he exercises no control. Given this, we must conclude not that Dunn's speaker wants to be enthralled in order to then become free, but that he believes freedom to consist in being properly enthralled and ravished. In a radical departure from what I've described so far, Dunn wishes for God not to respect personhood, to disregard the boundaries of the self in its given state. So he really wants as much interference from God as possible. So long as God pursues him considerately, so long, in fact, as he is not violent, Dunn cannot have the liberty for which he longs. He can only gain liberty if stripped of virtually everything associated with free movement. We see imprisonment rather than the removal of fetters, standing rather than motion, the experience of being drawn instead of self-direction, and the excruciating process of being made new instead of self-preservation or self-transformation. This may sound more like ideological mystification than it is. But you, for instance, argues that Paul, on whom Dunn draws, holds interest for thinking about freedom. But you turns to Paul in order, quote, to refound a theory of the subject that subordinates its existence to the aleatory dimension of the event without sacrificing the theme of freedom. And Paul holds out interest for Bidu in almost precisely the terms set out in Batter My Heart. And Bidu's reading of Paul, positive law of any kind, does not guarantee freedom, but makes individuals into automatons stripped of any genuine self-control. Love does this, or sorry, law does this because law in the Pauline framework automatically solicits its own transgression. So it just turns people, law by being in place turns people into automatons. So the Pauline subject's release from automatism comes only when the subject is seized and overwhelmed by an event in a rupture with the given world, emblematized for Bajuf by the moment when Paul on the road to Damascus is arrested by God's voice. Being so seized constitutes freedom by liberating individuals not only from the curse of the law but also from the determinants of the given. But Jews, Paul assumes that the Christian subject first comes into being with this truth event's occurrence when the work set out in Romans 12, 2, of being, quote, not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind, has begun. The free subject's subordination to the event is axiomatic. These are Bidu's words. I call subject the bearer of a fidelity, the one who bears a process of truth. The subject, therefore, in no way pre-exists the process. The process of truth induces a subject. But you believes the connection between freedom and being made new to be essential. In this regard, his account squares with Dunn's yearning and batter my heart for an event that will free him from his present existence and for fidelity to what has seized him. For Bajou, as for Dunn, only transformation would bring freedom. 
The most apt image for freedom for these two is not the image put forth by cognitive science or by Mill in his famous formulation, that of a stable self moving through space, but that of selves destabilized, undergoing drastic change. Freedom arrives if it arrives in this change. Such freedom cannot be perfectly predicted or guaranteed by law as it can according to champions of negative freedom and positive liberty. Since freedom for Badiou and Dunn involves our non-coincidence with our pre-existent self, it is intrinsic to freedom that its exact parameters and effects be unknown in advance. Now there are some more subtle politi political implications of Dunn's poem that I won't attempt to spell out right now. The less subtle implication, which I will mention, is that the relation that Dunn's poem describes, one that could be and has been described as masochistic, allows for freedom, at least in his understanding. Here, though, masochism allows for freedom not because the masochist can exercise surreptitious agency, and this is how uh, masochism gets recuperated in some accounts of its political potential, for instance, Foucault's, that like, you seem like you're in this powerless, passive position, but you actually have power. Uh, but that's not what Dunn's poem is doing. Rather, Dunn's masochism allows for freedom because Dunn, like Bajou, thinks of freedom not as free movement, but as transformation. In this case, transformation into a self for whom self-mastery has no value, a self free from the wish for mastery. In this sense, Dunn perhaps anticipates someone like Leo Bersani, who at points has praised masochism for the masochist's willingness to relinquish the desire for mastery in order to access jouissance. Now, uh, for my second example, this example to an extent secularizes what for Don is explicitly religious. It's a poem by Catherine Phillips, uh, it's also 17th century, Friendship's Mystery, which makes a religion out of uh, terrestrial friendship. Come, my Lucasia, Lucasia since, we see, since we see that miracles men's faith do move by wonders and by prodigy to the dull, angry world, let's prove there's a religion in our love. For though we were designed to agree, that fate no liberty destroys, but our election is as free as angels, who with greedy choice are yet determined to their joys. Our hearts are doubled by the loss, here at mixture is addition grown, we both diffuse and both engross, and we whose minds are so much one, never, yet ever, are alone. We court our own captivity, then thrones more great and innocent, toward banishment to be set free, since we wear fetters who whose intent not bondages, but ornament. Divided joys are odious found, and griefs united easier grow. We are ourselves, but by rebound, and all our titles shuffled so, both princes and both subjects too. Our hearts are mutual victims laid, while they, such power and friendship lies, are altars, priests, and offerings made. And each heart which thus kindly dies grows deathless by the sacrifice. And to avoid running on too long, I won't treat many of the complexities of this poem, and I won't talk about the first three stanzas at all. Mainly, I just want to highlight what I think are some important similarities and differences between this poem and Dunn's. Okay, so first, some, limit, some similarities. Like Dunn, Phillips seems to find freedom in captivity. Being set free in stanza four constitutes the opposite of liberty. It would be an unwilling banishment to be set free. Since the speaker has claimed liberty in stanza two, the liberty that exists in this poem must exist in the captivity that the poem represents. Second, like Dunn's speaker in relation to God, Phillips in relation to the friend experiences liberty partly in a transformation, in this heart that's grown deathless by its sacrifice. But critical differences between Dunn and Phillips also exist. First, instead of the absolutist one-way domination that Dunn fantasizes about in his poem, we have shared fetters and shuffled titles. Uh, it's worth remarking on both, I think, briefly, the shared fetters and the, and the shuffled titles. In the fourth stanza, the speaker carefully distinguishes the fetters of this friendship from bondage. Toward banishment to be set free, since we wear fetters whose ornament, not bondages, but ornament. The logic here suggests that being set free would be banishment because the fetters that they wear are not for bondage. Um, are not for bondage, but instead for ornament. If the fetters affected actual bondage, then perhaps to be set free would be freedom, not banishment. The distinction between fetters and ornaments and fetters as bonds is critical. The ornaments you can cast off, the bonds you cannot. So that's one point to be made, that Phillips, unlike Dunn, and more like some of the thinkers I've considered here, does or at least can think about freedom, even in the personal domain, and bondage as opposites, you know, at least in this stanza. 
But this raises another more difficult question about stanza four. How could the experience of fetters as ornaments, how could that constitute an experience of freedom? One way to answer this question would be to move to stanza five and say that the fetters referred to in stanza four are the temporary fetters of subjecthood that Lucasia and Orinda, that's the speaker's name, shuffle so that they can both be princes even as both are subjects. If this is the case, then the image of fetters here very much lends itself to Foucault's account of masochism's productive potential, that it allows participants to play with power relations, endows the ostensibly submissive position with flexibility and reversibility. So Dunn posits that freedom might exist within a masochistic situation because that situation frees the masochist from his given self in a way that's beyond his, his control. Phillips posits that fetters allow the unfettered to free themselves from their given selves by shuffling titles in a controlled masochistic game. For both Dunn and Phillips, freedom seems to be freedom from the, from the given, from given fixed identity. But Dunn and Phillips achieve that freedom rather differently. All the same, Phillips complicates matters in the final stanza. She's been dealing in outward ornaments, but now at the end she deals with the inward, with hearts and with their mutual victimage. Here, Phillips, I think, edges much closer to something like bondage. The heart, unlike the body fettered merely ornamentally, cannot cast off its bonds prior to its sacrifice. Friends' hearts are mutual, consensual victims, to be sure. In the end, though, how much does this consensual sacrifice differ from Dunn's plead, be broken, blown, and burned? To me, Phillips infuses the final stanza with comparable intensity to what we see in, in Dunn. Here, the masochistic situation offers not just the shuffling of identities, the shuttling back and forth from prince to subject, but the radical remaking of identity, the sacrifice of self into deathlessness, a happy self-shattering. Phillips puzzles me by refusing to represent a progression that clearly transitions from one masochistic mode, which might be said to look forward to Foucault, to another mode, which might be said to look forward to Bersani. But my puzzlement may just be the product of how innovative Phillips' poem is. Phillips innovates, I think, in brokering a compromise between masochism's more playful and intense forms. Phillips treats fetters as merely ornamental and unthreatening, yet also as absolutely binding. Through consent, freedom and bondage enter into indistinction, such that friends paradoxically exist in a broad field of masochistic experience, one capacious enough to accommodate not just sovereignty and subjection, but playful self-fashioning and intense self-shattering. In Friendship's Mystery, masochism frees the self, but Philip's poem also frees masochism from a single form. In examining Dunn and Phillips, my intention certainly hasn't been to say that bondage is not freedom's opposite. Uh, bondage often is freedom's opposite. Rather, my intention has merely been to say that bondage is not always freedom's opposite, and for more than one reason. Particularly when freedom is understood in terms of freedoms or legal provisions, it may often make sense to frame freedom in terms of free movement, to use that as your conceptual frame. But at the same time, I really do think that Jean-Luc Nancy remains right in his claim that freedoms can never grasp the stakes of freedom, just as the metaphor of freedom as free movement cannot exhaust the field of thought as to liberty. In their masochistic fantasies, Dunn and Phillips bear this out. Thank you both for your presentations. Uh, so my, my question is for James. Um, and I guess on one level, I'm wondering whether, so if freedom in respect to attachments, whether the attachments are religious in nature, attachments to God, or freedom as attachments to a lover, uh, whether that's really something significantly different than what Pettit and other Republicans mean when they're talking about freedom, which is, is specifically in relation to um, a just constitution of a state. Mm -hmm. And that, that free, the freedom bondage relationships might actually be considerably different in both those cases. So I'm wondering, is there a bit of an apples to oranges problem here? 
And then also with the, with the Pettit, um, he, he differentiates his understanding of liberty from either the positive versus negative sort of dichotomy. And a crucial differentiating factor is it's not just freedom as movement, it's freedom from arbitrary interference. Not even freedom from interference or even freedom from susceptibility to interference, but freedom from arbitrary interference, which gives him a, a, an important distinction for how he treats law from some versions of liberal theory, which view law as sort of essentially and necessarily cons uh, a constraint against freedom. Whereas for Pettit's version of republicanism, law is compatible, and its law and its constraints are compatible with freedom because of this issue of is the interference arbitrary or not? And sometimes susceptibility to the interference is compatible with freedom if it's not arbitrary, which for him means it has to track the interests. So does, that, I think, also might complicate the relation between, I, mean, I don't want to say bondage, but at least constraint, that constraint and freedom are compatible uh, in Pettit in ways that might, if we wanted to compare the freedom bondage from politically, from political realms to the realms of loving attachments, there might actually be more room for a compatibility of, of constraint and, and freedom. Uh, I prefer that term rather than bondage. I still have to think about constraint versus bondage. Um, yeah, uh, thanks for that question. I think there are sort of two, two, two parts to it. Um, the the uh, first part about um, freedom's compatibility with, with constraint, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's definitely true for virtually, you know, like every, like not just Pettit, but lo lo lots of other people. Freedom and constraint are not thought totally apart. The only way you can sort of have freedom is if there are certain constraints um, in place. Um, but I do think that... Um, with, with, with Pettit um, in his most recent book, but also in his older books, like in Just Freedom, um, the, like the way that you can know um, is uh, whether or not um, you're free. Is, as you say, you're, you're free from the threat of arbitrary interference. Not interference as such, but arbitrary interference. And what arbitrary interference does to you psychologically is it prohibits you from flourishing. Like flourishing is a very important term for him and for Pettit, flourishing means being able to sort of realize yourself, to go places, to do not like literal freedom of movement, but it's able to sort of pursue your aims and to flourish in a way that you see fit as long as it doesn't violate what other, you know, what other, other people flourishing in a similar way. And um, as uh, to the second part, the apples to oranges thing, I think that you're, you're right that there is a compatibility between framing like legislative freedom as term, in terms of free movement, like just metaphorizing it that way, and still leaving space for like uh, politically productive personal experience that involves bondage. But what I think Pettit it does is, we've talked a lot about vulnerability today, um, particularly uh, in the session that, that, that you chaired, and I think that Pettit um, only views vulnerability as something that's demeaning or, or abjecting. So that he, what he does is he takes vulnerability and turns it into, a, I think, into a negative term. Um, so I, like, in a way I can see how my paper seems to set it up as though these two ways of thinking about freedom are like, they can't be thought together. I think they can, but I think that Pettit himself um, denigrates vulnerability in a way that suggests that it's, it is quite hard when you're in the habit of thinking of uh, freedom with metaphors of free movement and, and you start to think about vulnerability and passivity and things like that, you tend to abject it. And I think that, that, that Pettit really does this, especially um, not in Just Freedom, but the book, um, uh, the book on Republicanism before that. It's a particular type of vulnerability, right? Vulnerability to arbitrary interference. And it's, that just seems oh, to be yeah. a kind of vulnerability right. than what's going right. on in, the, in right. the poetry. Right. It's as though, this is what I'll say though, I think to him it's virtually inconceivable that there could be another kind of vulnerability. You know what I mean? The, the only vulnerability he treats is the, is the bad kind. You know what I mean? So when he thinks about vulnerability, he thinks about the father abu you know, a father abusing his child or you know, some, something like that that is clearly, is clearly terrible. 
Um, and I'm not to say if Phil, Pet I'm not saying that if he was in this room right now, he might say, um, maybe he would say, yeah, what Don, what Don's talking about there, I'm, 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 I'm cool with that. That's good. That's productive. I don't, I don't know what he would say, but just from reading his work, it seems like he can't. He's incapable of thinking about vulnerable vulnerability as a positive, as a positive thing. But you're right that the vulnerability that he does discuss is specifically like terrible, terrible forms of it. Thank you. I can see how how, how the Dunn and the Phillips are incompatible with the um, Republican slash communitarian version of positive uh, liberty, but I don't see how it's incompatible with Berlin's account of positive liberty, which is precisely aimed at this, it would seem to me, because what, if you, th if you, how he proceeds to cash out the argument, in, at least in the two concepts as a, is to make it, is to make positive liberty susceptible to the surrender of the self to some sort of, of higher power or to, to placing it in bondage to a higher power. Now maybe the slippery move that he makes there is make that somehow your true self as opposed to being overpowered by another self. But I don't know, I, and I think Berlin would, I'm not, I'm not sure that, well anyway, yeah. Do you think that when Berlin in two essays, when he's like talking about positive liberty and this like domination of like one part of the self by the other part of the self, that's like he's like he's ultimately like not critical. yeah, that's not where he's going, right? Like that. Well, he is critical of it because yeah. he's going to go to negative liberty. Yeah, I'm yeah. not sure, but he does not. But I thought your your starting point was that both positive and negative liberty, uh, neither of these traditions have any, would have any necessary opposition oh. to bondage. Oh, and right. it seems to me that that's a little it. bit more ambitious right. um, because it seems like that's yeah. what Berlin yeah. is about. Yeah, that, 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 that's exactly right. And you're right to point out that Berlin thinks about positive liberty differently from like Charles Taylor and the communitarians. Yeah, right, yeah. and all this, and, and that if, if you think about what Skinner's doing is, I mean, what seems to have been going on is this is this gradual evacuation of the number of candidates who could count as positive liberty theorists, with Skinner moving, attempting to move large numbers of Republicans out of there, um, and maybe what we're left with is is a few English Hegelians, uh, perfectionists, and maybe not even them. But I think you're right that what that's missing is where the it, well. It seems the positive liberty field is populated by religious conceptions of liberty. Mm. 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 Yeah, that's fair. Excuse me? Oh, is it my turn? Okay. She's over there. Oh, oh I'm oh, sorry. I, I thought <laughs> I am not I'm in the place that I am. Um, I, my question is for Ariella. Thank you very much. Um, I think that your paper, there was a lot to think about in your paper, and at, at the end of this long thing, I'm sure there's much more than I got, so my question may seem simplistic. Um, in, in other words, I'm tired, um, but I, I really appreciated it, and I wanted to ask you to speak more about um, this idea of unlearning sovereignty, or that, or that unlearning sovereignty was a matter of learning other modes of acting, right? So that. Um, I wanted to just ask you, well, what does that actor training look like? Um, what, 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 how, would you, how would one, as, an, as having been brought into the actorliness of performing under sovereignty as one of these differential positions, what would, it, what would a different actor training be? Do we, is it necessary for, you said, it is, it is necessary to unlearn and, I think you said, rewind um, and I, I was interested in the word rewind. I suppose that means to a sort of pre-imperiality um, in order to resist the separation of citizen and refugee, which I completely find incredibly interesting. That, 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 citizen, that, that, that separation between citizen and refugee is structurally produced by imperialism, you said. I, I thought that was a really interesting way to, to say that, and yet I'm also really interested that I think that separation is endemic to theater itself so that you know instead of like learning a different actor training wouldn't we have to just unlearn the theater like get out of the theater i mean isn't the theater itself that isn't the structure of even thinking theater and theatricality maybe something we just have to get rid of um you know uh i, I don't know 
is there is there anything that's not um, yeah is there a way to unlearn that or, or is it a different kind of, of theater that you're imagining that's not the theatron, that's not the place for viewing, that doesn't have that architecture of division sort of scripted into it? So that's, that's my, my question. Thank you. I think that you transmitted me the role to say that I'm tired because your question was very eloquent. I'm not sure that my answer will be as eloquent at this time of the day because I'm also tired. <laughs> Uh, but I'll try. Thank you for the question. Uh, you actually asked me to uh, spell out all my books, so, <laughs> because this is about <laughs> unlearning sovereignty, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'll try. I'll try to make it very uh, condensed. Uh, yeah, I speak about unlearning sovereignty, and it's a long process. Yesterday, when uh, Sharon gave her talk, I thought about. Uh, she, someone asked her, I don't remember who, because you know too many questions and interesting questions, but someone asked her about uh, uh, thinking about agency in a non-sovereign way. And I remember when I started my book a few years ago, that this is part of it, I distinguished, for example, in relation to revolution between sovereign revolution and civil revolution. And it took me, wow, many years to understand that actually I have to unlearn sovereignty and to qualify sovereignty, and then to understand what were the other possible sovereign formations. Uh, so unlearning sovereignty was part of unlearning all these unqualified uh, terms and trying to, under, to, trying to rehearse not for the big, for the big day, but rehearsal in terms of really a tedious work of uh, writing and rewriting all these terms in a way that I will be able to go to the archive and go through materials that uh, many historians read, or read them already, and all of a sudden understand them differently through this pro process of unlearning sovereignty. But unlearning, as I understand sovereignty, and it will want to be unlearning theater. What I'm trying to speak about is unlearning our roles. So I am, of course, and it, I, I feel, it's feel, it feels great to speak in a room where everybody is inspired by Hannah Arendt, so I don't have to, to defend, and I don't have to say that, of course, I understand this and this and this. So what I'm trying to do is to understand, okay, indeterminacy, but what determine our actions, nonetheless. And I think that the division of roles is the theater in which we, per we perform. And this division of roles is, uh, uh, is something that I'm trying to understand as the theater. Uh, so what I would uh, associate with unlearning sovereignty is first of all, unlearning sovereignty is an unqualified term. Then to go to the archive, if I am unlearning the ro my role, I will go to the archive only with uh, those with whom I am governed differentially. So every time when I go to the archive, I'm not going to study the infiltrator or the refugee, but I'm going with the refugee or with the infiltrator. How do I do it? I smuggle documents from the archive and I share them with people who do not have access to the archive. Many ways to undo the archive and many ways to imagine that I'm entering the archive always with my companion. So I cannot read the documents in the, the looted document in the archive as if they, I'm provided with scholarship, but as if now we are sharing something that was looted and I share it with my companion. Uh, so this is part of this process of uh, unlearning and rewinding is because, uh, uh, and I was so happy to hear you resisting against nostalgia every time that somebody tried to say something wrong about going back and I think that instead of looking for a new political language or instead of thinking or envisioning new political formations, there is such a big repertory uh, in the, that is constantly smashed uh, in the last 500 years, and it's not, thinking about pre-imperial formation is not going to necessarily to 483 or 85 or whatever, it's at every moment, moment we have what is made into a pre-imperial formation. Going to Palestine 47 and discover in the, discovering in the archive all these civil alliances between Jews and Palestinians committing not to take part in violence, even though it, everything was violated in, in the process of a few months, but 
finding these documents and being able to read them for what they were, if we suspend the constitution of sovereignty that became uh, uh, a fait accompli already in 48. So this is for me going to a pre-imperial moment, but not before imperialism. It is all the options that are uh, uh, made obsolete by imperialism to reactivate them. So uh, the process of unlearning is trying uh, uh, to uh, imagine all these formations from the past. So it's not imagining uh, and inventing uh, future uh, possibilities, but imagining in a way that we will be uh, able to uh, bring them back from the archive or bring them back from the uh, squares or bring them back, back from wherever they are uh, uh, eliminated by sovereignty. And by sovereignty, I don't mean uh, one source of power of the sovereign. What I mean is us. And this is why I speak about being citizen as a light weaponry of differential sovereignty. So I'm learning this, and I cannot not be a citizen because I am a citizen. This is what I said. If I try not to be a citizen and to let the refugee come with me to the archive, both, will be, both of us will be punished. So it's not upon each individuals to change it, but it's, this is where we have to think about unlearning sovereignty, about our roles and our uh, blaring of, these, uh, of our roles. Thank you. Uh, yet again, these, these two papers worked beautifully together. I, I, I think I just want to... Thank to the organizers. Well, I <laughs> want to say that Adi, Adi did the programming and, and, and he is Amazing. the genius uh, <laughs> who is responsible for that. Um, I wanted to... Um, I, uh, uh, yeah, anyway, very great, great papers. I, uh, each one had a, had a moment of critical or of what I see as a critical audacity that seems to me at odds with your um, with the ultimate aims of your paper. Um, Ariella, I I, um, I love this idea of differential sovereignty. I, I'm glad you 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 kind of um, mentioned Sharon's paper, which I think your paper is in a kind of interesting dialectical uh, relationship with um, but, the, but, but the moment of what? Sharon. uh, Sharon's, Sharon's paper um, I mean the concept of differential sovereignty seems to me in a in something like a dialectical relationship to introduce a, a new term with her notion of non-sovereign agency I, I, I don't know how you're thinking about that I mean I'm sure you've been thinking a lot about that since her paper but the, the moment of audacity I wanted to allude to was your opening gesture, which is the, um, the attempt to address sovereignty from the perspective of the non-citizen, which is fascinating, but it seems to be, a, a, but it's a large, it's a large um, um, gesture, it's a large move that you're making. Um, and, of, and of course, it's predicated upon a whole set of um, linguistic um, um, refusals on your part, the, the, the refusal of the, the notion of the French Revolution, the refusal of the term French Revolution, the refusal of the term uh, popular sovereignty, um, and there are several other other moments like that. And, and then uh, uh, kind of added to that is this moment of, of course, interpretation. I mean, you're interpreting the, 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 um, this, pl this play by de Gouges in, in very interesting ways, you, a, a, a set of interpretative gestures. Monarchy is not omnipotent. Um, roles are, pres are, are prescribed for life. Um, uh, so there are a, set, a whole set of in, interpretative um, gestures which, which seems to me in tension with your underlying gesture methodological gesture of um, uh, uh, of thinking about sovereignty from from the perspective of the of the non-citizen which which is I suppose from a differentially sovereign perspective so I wondered what how you would re re respond to that and then um, James the moment that I thought I thought ha had a kind of moment of aud audacity to it is the um, moment when talking about the Dunn poem it was absolutely an aside but you said that um, uh, what, you're, what you propose to say about the poem may sound more like ideological mystification than it is, which, or at least the poem may sound more like ideological mystification than, than it is. So, uh, and so you, in, in other words, you're setting aside the whole question of uh, ideological mystification, which is, I, I think, um, interesting, but again, it's a moment of, um, uh, of sovereign 
it's an, it's an interpretative, it's a moment of interpretative sovereignty, which is interesting, I mean, interesting, especially given that the poem seems to me to be, um, about, uh, I, mean, I mean, the freedom in question is freedom from sovereignty, it, it, it seems, or freedom from individuation, but in fact, freedom from so sovereignty. So um, I, I wondered how you re would respond to that um, take on Dunn's poem. And, and, and I mean, I'm sure I think it's partly what you were saying, but what I'm interested in is the, t is the sort of tension, in, in a sense, the tension that uh, you're both uh, struggling with as readers of uh, literary texts and texts that are enmeshed in this complex relationship to sovereignty. Uh, I'll start. Uh, thank you, team. Uh, wow, <laughs> again. A huge question. Yeah. I'll try. I am not sure that I'll be able to answer to all the, the layers of your question, but I'll try. I think that what motivates me in this project, maybe besides many other things, but in relation to your question, is uh, what does it mean to, uh, to write or to make research or to be a scholar when you're a citizen? and you are governed differentially from other who are not citizens. This is the first question that, uh, that shapes everything that I do in the archive, out of the archive, in my, I mean, when I read books, etc. So this is one side of the, uh, the beginning of the answer. The other side is what, how to question these political key, key political concepts that in the process of 500 years imposed a phenomenal field and an epistemic apparatus that bound us, that condition us. We cannot think about sovereignty. All the, most, of the, uh, most, most of the writings on sovereignty start with the way that sovereignty constitutes itself from its beginning. But its beginning is always so late, so many years after, the violence, the imperial violence that prepared the terrain for the emergence of this sovereignty. So how do you re-articulate slavery to uh, the French Revolution? How you skip this moment that Zizek will stand here on the stage and will say that the uh, slaves should be grateful to the French uh, revolutionary for being freed? Uh, so, so the question is how to rethink sovereignty, not its in own terms. So, in a process of few years, it led me to reconceptualize the archive, to reconcept, to understand that I have to uh, think about the conditions of thinking these key political terms. I cannot just think them. I have to think about the conditions of thinking them. So I have to think about temporality, speciality, and body politic, which leads me to understand that I cannot study sovereignty upon its temporality from its beginning, because its beginning is massacre, slave, uh, enslavement, uh, expulsion, etc., etc. So, uh, just to, to give an example, when I read, for example, to uh, uh, Steeler James' book on uh, the Black Jacobins, first, it's obvious that it is not part of the French Revolution, right? Because all the narratives of the French Revolution do not account for Haiti for being part of the French Revolution. But what is interesting is when I read C.L.R. James that focuses mainly on Toussaint Louverture, in each and every page we have Toussaint Louverture, in, in each and every slave. It's not only Toussaint Louverture, the figure, the black Jacobin, but we have Toussaint Louverture in each and every page, which means that what we have there is all the time this struggle between this movement to enslave, this movement to uh, impose sovereignty, and the movement, the counter movement of resisting by the slaves. So what I'm trying to, to conceptualize, what you identify as a, as a tension, is to not to account for sovereignty, but to account for the struggle of differential sovereignty to impose itself and to eliminate the other options. So when I'm speaking about differential sovereignty, it's not a poetic way to speak about uh, uh, many differences. It's a way to account for a very concrete uh, type of violence, which is that each and every one of us is governed with other people who are not counted on the stage uh, of the theater of sovereignty. I don't know if I answered you, but this, is, this will be the, uh, the perspective or the, uh, the field where, from where my answer will emerge. 
Okay, uh, so uh, just, just quickly with the, the ideological mystification thing. Um, sometimes this poem, Batter My Heart, is read as like being about Dunn's relationship with James I. Um, the idea being that like he um, is kind of like abject, pathetic, a flatterer or something like that. I don't think we have to read the poem that way. But even if we do, I think we can still say that there's something more than ideological mystification going on here because... Um, Look at, I mean, just look at all the commands that the speaker of that poem is issuing to his sovereign. He's saying, do, you know, better my heart, divorce me. Like, do, like, he's quite, you know, quite petulant so that he does want um, to undermine his own. Dude. <laughs> he, he, does, he does want to, um, he does want to, uh, <laughs> to, to undermine his, uh, like, obviously to, 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 to uh, like, destroy himself, to undermine his own sovereignty. But the like, manner in which he does that, the declarative, imperative manner in which he does that, would mean that in undoing his own sovereignty, he would also undo his sovereign sovereignty. So, yeah. 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 That's, so that's basically what I would say. That's, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, just to know how much uh, time we're working with, we have 12 minutes. I have three <laughs> names. Uh, does anyone else want to add something to the question? And so... So thank you very much for both of the papers. Um, much to think about. Um, my question is for James's paper, and I'm very sympathetic to the larger project, as many people might guess. Um, I think I'm not entirely sure where it's headed insofar as I wasn't clear the extent to which you want to say, well, there are some models of freedom that are not antithetical to bondage or whether you want to say those models of freedom that imagine themselves as antithetical to, bo to bondage are in fact rather simplistic models. But what I actually wanted to ask about is kind of in the reading of the two poems, and I want to give a response that I'm not sure if I buy it or not, but wondered how you responded, that first in the reading of Dunn, I mean that third line, that I may rise and stand, seems to me quite a, an assertive, I mean I was thinking about, I mean, Augustine keeps coming up, but sort of Augustine in the garden and the kind of prostrating oneself in prayer, that's not what's going on. This is rising up and standing. That seems like a very revolutionary kind of self-assertive act. And so how much this is um, act violently such that I may be free is, I think there would be more to say on that. I would be interested to hear that. But even to the extent that we do see this as just a movement from one bondage to the other, then one might also read Dunn as just in a quite long-standing Christian convention of his freedom is found precisely in the proper relationship with God. And part of me wants to say, well, what's surprising about that um, if, if we see it that way? But then the Phillips, to me, reads quite differently in that the intersubjectivity that is crucial there is not a horizontal relationship, but much more of a, I'm sorry, is not a vertical relationship, but a much more horizontal relationship. So it's quite crucial that the titles can be shuffled, right? We, we stand in equal relationships with each other. Um, we are remade by that, but why not, I, I guess, you know, I want to see that as sort of roots for an intersubjective conception of the subject and ultimately of freedom in ways that sound a lot like some of Hegel's more romantic early writings on love, for instance, and one might see as some of the key roots of some of the people like Taylor, whom you want to, to class as the communitarians. So it wasn't clear to me how much that's really an alternative trajectory or some of the kind of thinking or some of the strands of thought that get channeled into some of what gets grouped as communitarian, though, as you said, most of them reject that name and so forth. But um. So um, I'm, I'm definitely relinquishing mastery at this point. Um, <laughs> um, but, I'll, but I'll try to, um, I, I guess my, my, my question has to do with the how religion plays a part of both of your papers. And let me start with um, Ayala. I mean, um, I'm, I'm wondering why, uh, in order to make your argument that you need to talk about theatricality in relationship to sovereignty, and, uh, and that because um, 
sovereignty and theatricality or, you know, or spectacle is so linked to Catholicism and, um, and to the Baroque that, that um, um, and that then, of course, reemerges in the modern era in, in Benjamin as the aestheticization of politics and, and, and fascism. So I'm just wondering why you need, need that. And of course, the, the text I immediately think of, of course, is Rousseau's in Letter to D'Alembert, you know, I mean, where there's this critique of, of um, participatory, I guess, you know, democracy, and, and, but against theatricality. So, and, on, and for you, James, um, uh, I, I guess, you know, my, my, my I want to ask, because it's sort of kind of a methodologically speaking, a kind of historical question, or you know, how you historically contextualize your argument in invoking something like the Dunn poem, right? Um, because as, um, I mean, as Tal just said, this can be read in terms of, of tropes that belong to you know, a religious tradition that wouldn't seem particularly surprising. Um, so then I would ask, you know, why, um, now it's not that you, one can't reuse it for other purposes, actually a wonderful use of the, of the poem is in John Adams's opera, Dr. Atomic, where it's the big moment where Oppenheimer actually you know, recites this, or sings it, um, uh, in relationship to science, right? And so, so the the it's not God, but it's science that that is that he's engaged with, and to which he has to submit, and it becomes you know very very complicated. So I guess that that um, it would seem to me important in in terms of your argument to think just to think about how you would how you would use these texts um, in discussions about freedom and liberalism. Um, uh, I mean, yeah, I guess I also wouldn't, I mean, I wrote a book on masochism, so I get very touchy about the thing, and, and, and I would not <laughs> want to, well, I wouldn't want to read John Donne as, as, as a, a masochistic poem, because it's a modern concept. So. Um, I'm really going to pass because I was just going to invite, ask Ariella to say more about sovereignty, but you've done that. But if I could just really quickly say that um, the line is that I may rise and stand or throw me, right? So, I mean, James, you'll say more about that with more knowledge than I, but, but it's a fascinating line because you can't be overthrown unless you're standing, but that comes later, as it were. Uh, so that's a way in which, although lots of the poem sounds as though it's, um, as it were, giving orders or topping from the bottom to pick up that trope. Um, uh, these dense moments are, are fascinatingly hard to, hard to place. Um, this will be quick. I'll just say a word to Ariella. Um, you know, I'm very sympathetic, of course, with a lot of what you're arguing. But I wonder um, why you don't also look at the nation state form. I mean, you're looking at what happened. I mean, you're, you're, you're really emphasizing imperialism and the imperialist p p er, past or erasures that paved the way for enslavements, that paved the way for sovereign power. Um, but I think the nation state form itself is problematic. I mean, even if you could disentangle it somehow from an imperial past, because there is a kind of um, uh, exclusion that's, that's intrinsic to, intrinsic to nation state um, uh, polities, which is that, that it, and that is the distinction between citizen and foreigner. And in other words, there's no, I mean, it's especially nation states. And I think that becomes particularly difficult when nation states define themselves in ethno-national terms, where the nation is actually an ethno-nation. But even when in the cases of civic uh, uh, nationalism or civic polity, civic national polities, the nation state is less than the entire world, right? So there are always going to be those exclusions. And I don't, I mean, that's, um, so that to me adds, an, it's a, it's another, adds another set of problems. Uh, and you, that, I don't think, those exclusions, you're not going to be able to escape uh, if you stay with or embrace in some way the nation state form. So I guess that, you know, just thinking about the nation state form as being important to look at in addition to or in, in conjunction with looking at imperialism and imperial histories. 
Um, I also um, I also caught you sometimes saying, well, we need a different kind of sovereignty. I, maybe I got that wrong. I mean, I know you're talking a differentiated sovereign power, which I love that whole concept. But when you, you said we have to imagine, sometimes I th think you're, you're looking for alternative sovereignties, or you may, even mentioned that phrase, and I'm wondering why not just, you know, why? Why look for alternative models of sovereign power? Uh, and why not be more radical than that? Um, and sort of, you know, make the argument that there's something fundamentally problematic about the desire for sovereign power, the desire for power that takes a sovereign form. So, uh, and, and uh, I'll just end with think, saying that I, I do agree with Suzanne that I think we're, on the one hand, the theatrical, it, it, it's really fun to begin to think about being on the stage of politics and who gets to be, who has to be off stage, who's, you know, consigned to the role sweeping up and who is center stage and so on. But I think the one problem I have with that is that, um, oh, now where was I going with this? I, I just lost it, so forget it. <laughs> forget it, yeah, I'm done, sorry. So we technically have two minutes left, like one minute, one minute. Given that there's no panel, we have I'll do my best. All yours. It's all mine. Okay, so. Uh, Suzanne, why do I uh, speak about theatricality? Thank you for both questions, of course. I'll do it short. Why do I uh, speak about theatricality? I don't speak about theatricality as what is performed on stage for an audience. So I'm not speaking about spectacle. I'm speaking about what I take from theater is the division of role. This is only what I take from theater. And the division of role is what stabilizes uh, sovereignty and what in the first phase of sovereignty that usually is not associated with sovereignty, it is enforced upon people to become slave, to become uh, 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 indentured uh, workers, to become whatever. I, I made a very long list earlier. So this is my very short answer to you and my try very short answer to you. Uh, John, is, uh, you ask me why I don't look at the uh, nation state. My whole discussion of sovereignty, differential sovereignty, is about the nation state. I didn't discuss it here, but it is about so differential sovereignty is na the no, nation I state. That, but I'm saying that even if you were to get rid of all the, somehow unwind and, get, and, and transform all those other relationships that were rooted in imperialism, imperialist erasures, colonialism, and so on, you'd still have one differentiation that you couldn't get rid of in a nation state form, which is the, the distinction between the citizen and the foreigner, which then you know, very quickly produces a whole set of new problems. But the nation state is post-imperialism. I mean, not post-imperialism, yeah. it is part of imperialism. Right. But, well, anyway, we can... Okay, yeah. and the, but the other question, let me just uh, address the other question. Um, that you ask me why not to be more radical and not speak about sovereignty. I insist on speaking about different type of sovereignty because what I'm trying to do is once I qualify sovereignty and I say that all what, uh, all what remain or all what was consolidated in all these 200 nation states that the globe is covered with today is differential sovereignty. But in Along these 500 years of history, people struggled all the time to create and to impose different formations. But maybe so, not sovereign formations. So what I'm trying to do is to account for their political formations. And with that, what I'm trying to uh, associate with an uh, uh, alternative sovereign formations is not sovereignty reduced to the source of power of a sovereign, but the way that people imagine together their, their common life based on the idea of co-citizenship. And you see it in maroon societies, and you see it, if I had more time, I would reconstruct the uh, uh, non-differential uh, sovereignty that was in, tra in, uh, uh, in a process of being shaped in Palestine from the moment when partition was imposed until the state was created in 10 months, Jews and Palestinians all around Palestine struggle to uh, 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 commit themselves to the local f political formations that they had and not to uh, uh, submit all of them to one single sovereignty, which is differential sovereignty. So I insist on accounting. When I'm speaking about going to the archive or studying with my companions is because I want to account for all these uh, long-lasting efforts of other people prior to my my appearance in the world 
they struggled for many things, and I think that there is a huge repertory to account for and to imagine not a new sovereignty, but what they tried to uh, defend when they struggled imperialism. So all these anti-imperial formation along 500 years, for me, are a repertory to imagine alternative sovereign formations based on the body politic, not on the pole of, not on the source of the sovereign. I'll make this really quick. Um, or, 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 right. <laughs> what, what I'll just say about Dunn is that, I, like, yes, there is a conventional aspect to this poem, although I also think that there are quite unconventional aspects, like when he asks God to ravish him, that you're not going to find that in his sermons, for example, uh, in Dunn's sermons. So that, like, it's conventional in some ways, unconventional in other ways. And then with respect to uh, masochism and, like, whether it's, like, it's just not right to uh, use a concept that comes up after Sakar Masak and, and start talking uh, about that in relationship to Dunn, I will just say that I, I, um, I don't think... Um, like, A, I wouldn't, if I couldn't do stuff like that, I wouldn't have a career. And B, um, <laughs> if, like, it, there's no reason for us to, I don't think, to legislate in, in, in advance what a text from an earlier period can or can't say. I agree. Okay. I would agree with okay. that. Okay. Sweet. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on this note of sweet agreement, uh, I want to thank our panelists and also uh, reiterate Adi's thanks to all the participants of this uh, <laughs>